QuickBooks Online, customer accounts receivable or get paid cycle. Get ready to start moving on up with QuickBooks Online. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course, each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Using the free QuickBooks Online test drive, searching in our search engine for QuickBooks Online test drive, selecting the option that has Intuit.com within it, Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks Online. We're going to be using the United States version and verifying that we're not a robot. Zooming in by holding down control up on the scroll wheel currently at 125% on the zoom in. Also note if I hit the cog drop down we're currently using the accountant view as opposed to the business view. We'll try to toggle back and forth between the two views so we can see the locations under both of them. We're going to go to the tab up top right click on it and duplicate it. And then right click on the duplicated tab. We're going to put our major financial statement reports in here as we always do in our setup process. Back to the middle tab as that one to the right is thinking. And we're going to go to the reports on the left hand side. Going on into that balance sheet report. As that is thinking, I'm going to go to the uh, tab to the right. Reports again on the left hand side. This time the profit and loss. I'm going to close up the hamburger. Scroll up to the top range change for the current period selecting the starting point 010122 tab 123122 that's january through december 2022 run it to make sure it updates then tab to the left and scroll up to the top close up the hamburger range change or 101222 uh, tab 123122 tab and then run the report that's the setup process we do every time Going back to the first tab now, if I hit the drop down up top in the new button, in prior sections we've been taking a look at what I would call the vendor cycle, the cycle of transactions through that section. Now we're going to move on over to the revenue side of things. You might call it the revenue cycle, the sales cycle, the accounts receivable cycle, the cycle in which at the end of it we expect money to be coming in, deposits to the checking account for goods and services we provided to customers. We also, once again, have to understand the terminology that's used in the QuickBooks software and that it will differ oftentimes than the terminology we use even in accounting world outside of the software. In other words, customers term. We, as a business owner, are still customers of our vendors. Our vendors, the people we buy from, see us as customers. So we can call ourselves customers. But we're, from the accounting software perspective, the customers represent people that we sell to clearly and that's i think a little bit more straightforward oftentimes than the term vendor or the term bill which can get a little bit muddled up so customers are the people that we are selling goods and services to in order to generate revenue revenue generation is basically the goal of the business from a financial kind of standpoint and then of course we've got the forms that are going to be involved in the revenue generation the major two revenue generation forms are going to be the sales receipt. That's the form we would use on a cash based type of system where we have a cash register, for example. And then we've got the invoice up top, which is the form that we're typically going to use on an accrual system in this in a way that we're going to have to record the sale, even though we haven't yet received the money and track the receivable. Now, this gets a little bit tricky because you might also say, well, what about the deposit form? I don't even see it here under the customer section. Isn't that part of the customer cycle, given the fact that we're expecting money to be going into our business at the end of the cycle? Well, it's over here in other, partially because we might have deposits from things outside of, of customers, not as many, but we might put money into the business ourselves with a deposit. We might get like a, a loan, for example. Also note 
that if we use the deposit form as the form to, to record revenue generation instead of these two forms, we can lose a little bit of detail because the deposit form doesn't have the capacity to, to record the items in the same way as the invoice and the sales receipt. So I'm gonna discuss that a little bit more by going to a flowchart. Notice that the QuickBooks Online has a flowchart here in the dashboard, but I think it's easier to look at this flowchart, which is actually the, the desktop version flowchart. It's just any kind of flowchart just to look at the accounting cycle and think about it in general and how we're gonna use it for our particular business within QuickBooks Online. So we're focused here on the customer cycle. And I wanna think about it from the easiest type of cycle to the most difficult type of cycle. The easiest kind of business that you can have basically to do your bookkeeping in on the customer side of things would be a cash-based system, but not just a cash-based system, one in which you can rely on the bank feeds to go through before you record any transaction, which is not a full service accrual system. That's more of a, a, a not quite full service accrual system, but an easy system to use. It can only be used, however, if you're in a certain type of industry like gig work, for example, if you're getting paid by platforms like Google or Amazon, and you could just wait till the money clears your bank, and then you're just gonna record it as revenue once it clears. In that case, you will in essence be using a deposit form but through the bank feeds. The bank feeds will come through, you're gonna record it as revenue at that time, and the system will see that as, in essence, a deposit type form. So you'll still be, in essence, using a deposit form. Now you lose some detail with the deposit form because uh, if you're not using an invoice or a sales receipt, you're not using the same kind of items that are set up, which means you don't have the same capacity to run sub-ledgers. Uh, for sales, for example, run a sub ledger, breaking out your sales by the items that you sold, the goods and services you sold. And you might not be able to run a sub ledger report as easily, even for the customers, even though on the deposit form, you could usually pull the customer from the information on, on the deposit electronic transfer in the bank feeds. So if it's coming from Amazon, you could say it's Amazon. Uh, money come from Amazon and you want to add that detail if you can if you can but uh, You still might not be able to run the subsidiary reports breaking out your sales by customer because the deposit form Isn't really designed to record revenue so But it still might be totally worth doing in that kind of industry now the next step up of, of complexity would be having a cash based system where you have a cash register in which case you have to do a full service cash based system, meaning you record the transaction and then they're gonna clear the bank and then you use the bank feeds or bank reconciliation process or both in order to reconcile what you did to what the bank did separately. So in that case, if you have a cash register, for example, you, you don't wanna just collect all your money from the cash register, say it's cash and say you're selling $5 transactions and then deposit it into the bank and then wait till it clears the bank before you record the revenue. You could do that, but usually what you wanna do from an internal control standpoint is record the transaction at the point of sale of the check register. And then at the end of the day, you can kind of tie out what you sold on the check register to what the register says you sold. You can count your cash and tie that out to what the register says you sold and give yourself an internal control. Now, at the point in time that you're putting transactions into the register, you might think that you would just deposit it into the checking account every time you got cash. I'm just gonna say, I got cash, I'm gonna increase the checking account by $5, by $5, by $5, or whatever you're selling. But you don't really wanna do that either because when you actually deposit the money, if it's cash, for example, or credit cards, you have a similar issue of this grouping problem. When you deposit it uh, into the bank physically, you're gonna deposit it all together in one lump sum of like $200 instead of a bunch of $5 transactions. And so when you go to reconcile using the bank feeds or the bank reconciliation, you're gonna have to reconcile these $5 transactions that you put into the system versus the $200 that you put in that the bank sees as one lump sum. Therefore, you typically could use a clearing account, a holding account, a petty cash account, and undeposited funds. So when we have the cash register, we record the transactions, the sales happen at this point in time, 
It allows us then to enter the items. It allows us to, to track our sales by item and put our money then into an undeposited funds, the money we're holding onto, so that when we deposit it into our system, the checking account in our system, the grouping of the deposits will match what clears the bank, making the reconciliation process as easy as possible. So that's the second easiest kind of system. And then the third uh, system is a full accrual type of system. That's a system where we have to invoice someone. And remember, you can't really just choose which system you want. You can't be like, well, I'm just gonna do, I'm just gonna do the, my stuff by the bank recs. It's easy as possible. You can't do that if you're in an industry where you have to invoice people. <laughs> so if I'm a bookkeeper and people expect that industry expects that I do the work first and then bill them, well, then that's probably what I'm gonna have to do. And that means I'm gonna have to use an accrual system. So if I have an invoicing system like a bookkeeper, an accountant, a tax preparing oftentimes, or landscaping or something like that, then I do the work first and then I invoice with the invoice. Now the invoice is one of those terms that gets quite mixed up or quite complex because uh, the invoice is usually from an accounting standpoint, what we use to bill, you might say, which would be the indicating a bill form, but to bill the customers for work that we did. So from an accounting standpoint, we call invoices the things, the form that we used to charge the customer for goods and services we provided on account, meaning they're gonna pay us at some point in the future, as opposed to the sales receipt, which represents the data form we're gonna put if we collect the money in some way, shape or form, cash or credit card or whatever, at the, point in t at the same point in time we do the work at the cash register, for example. So the, so the invoice then is gonna, is gonna, when we issue the invoice, it's gonna increase an accounts receivable account which adds another level of complexity because now we've got these IOUs, customers owe us money, and the sale will be recorded at this point in time. Then at some future point, we're gonna have to collect on the money that we that, that we're, were expected for the work that we did with the receive payment. And we have the same issue with the receive payment as we had with the create sales receipt of, do I want to uh, record this directly into the checking account at this point in time? Or maybe I'm gonna have a grouping of multiple sales receipts that I then wanna put in to the checking account in one lump sum so I can reconcile. In other words, if I get multiple receipts from invoices for cash, and then I'm gonna deposit them into the bank at the end of the night as a group lump sum, I don't wanna record these sales receipts directly into the checking account because I'll end up with that same kind of, of issue where I won't be able to reconcile very easily. And so therefore I might put these into an undeposited funds account and then deposit them into the checking account, recording them as a deposit in the checking account in the same grouping as is actually gonna be physically going into the checking account with multiple receive payments and or credit sales receipts that will then show up on uh, the bank statement so I can reconcile as easily as possible. So if I'm gonna use my bank feeds in this kind of transaction, again, I'm, I gotta think where the bank feed's gonna fit in. We'll talk more about that uh, when we get to the bank feed section, but just note it's a little bit more complex in that system. Also note that if you have inventory, that's gonna complicate things as well because we saw that the inventory kind of strides both of these uh, payment cycle and the receipt cycle or the vendor cycle and the customer cycle and we have different formats of inventory, we might say the easiest thing to do with inventory would be to try to stay in a cash-based system. If I try to stay in a cash-based system with inventory, when I buy the inventory, I'll just increase the inventory account, but I'll tr I'll, I won't I will won't record, uh, I'll record the other side going to cost of goods sold. When I buy it, I'll expense it when I purchase the inventory. And, and in that way, when I record the sale, I can just record the sales side of things uh, like similar to a service account. And that would be the easiest thing to do if you have like custom inventory, you're doing custom projects, you're buying inventory for a particular project, you're just gonna expense it when you buy it, you finish the project and then you charge the customer. But if you have a significant amount of inventory, then you gotta think, do you want a periodic inventory or perpetual inventory system? A periodic inventory system might be one where you track the inventory outside of QuickBooks in say Excel. And whenever you purchase the inventory, you increase the inventory account in QuickBooks, but not the sub ledger of the inventory by unit. And then when you sell the inventory, 
you just record the sales side of things, not the decrease in inventory or cost to get sold, and then you make periodic adjustments based on your physical count of the inventory and and the, and the the inventory cost to get sold equation beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory adjustments. If you're doing a full service inventory in the system, uh, then a perpetual inventory system, then when you buy the inventory, it will not only increase the inventory account, but also the sub ledger tracking by unit. When you sell the inventory, you're going to have to use an invoice or sales receipt as opposed to a deposit form, because these are the two forms that are designed to connect to the items that will decrease the inventory accounts automatically uh, when you record them. So that's going to be the overarching kind of forms that so you got to think about what kind of business to, am I in and what's going to be the general flow for the revenue cycle? How can I make that flow as easy as possible? Also, you might have sales taxes involved in this as well. And sales taxes are easiest to do within the system if you're using the sales receipts and invoices to record transactions. You can come up with a system where you make deposits and you do it like not using the QuickBooks kind of pre-built in system. And we might talk about that later, but sales tax, of course, muddies the waters a bit as taxes always do. So if I go back on over, when we enter the normal transactions for customers, we're going to hit the drop down. If it's, if we have a, a, a system where we're going to be collecting the easiest system, we do the bank feeds first. And, and then we just record the in the income from the bank feeds. In that case, you'd go into the banking section here and we'd go into uh, the deposits and we would just simply record the deposits that we have in the bank feeds and record them directly to an income account. And it would just be like Amazon income or whatever, or whatever we want to call it coming through. And that would be the easiest thing to do. But, uh, and, and that would be using a deposit form, which doesn't give us as much detail for the sub reports, but that would be an easy system to do if we had the type of company to do that. If we had a cashed register kind of system, then we probably would have to be using the sales receipts. And then once the sales receipts are compiled, then we're going to deposit them in the grouping that makes sense lining up to the physical deposits we made to the bank. Or if we have an accrual system, we're going to have to enter an invoice. And then you can see the next one would be the receive payments. And then we're going to go and make the receive payments to a deposit form. You can also have an estimate, which is kind of like a purchase order in that it doesn't record an actual transaction into the system, but what happened before the invoice, if we're trying to like bid on a job or give someone an estimate of how much uh, it would cost if they want a particular inventory item or service item. Now, once we enter these transactions, then we're typically going to be tracking in what I would call like the customer center, which would be on the left hand side under the accounting view under the sales items. And this is where up top, then you've got everything you've got uh, all of your sales items. So then you can kind of I'm going to close this one, you could sort and we'll go into this a little bit more in future presentations. And then you've got your invoices. Obviously, if you're on an accrual system, it's more complex to track your, the information for your customers, because you're going to try to collect on these outstanding items, estimates, uh, payment links, here's your list of customers, and then uh, your products and services. So, so then if I check this out, just one last thing on the business view, switching this over to the business view, just to see where these things are located there. And if I go back up to the get things done page, then we still got our plus button, which still gives us, you know, the forms, which would be the easiest thing to go into. And then we're going to track our customers and typically outstanding balance if we have an accrual system, if we're using invoices, in other words, which would be under the get paid and pay area. And then up top, we're looking at the get paid area, which would be what I would call the customer cycle, revenue cycle, sales cycle. So here's your customers, estimates, invoices, payment links, product services. Now they have that transaction detail in a different location under bookkeeping here. So that's where your uh, transactions up top are. And if I go to skip this item and I'm going to close this out, this is your transactions. You have your bank fee tab up top and then you've got your sales transaction. So your sales transaction is similar to the expenses thing that we looked at before. 
which allows you to sort kind of the the normal transaction types here by uh, by the by the items that are in your in your cycle for the revenue cycle or sales cycle. So we're going to go into some of those tools uh, a little bit more in future presentations.